I joined the police force to make a real difference and found being out on patrol in uniform frustrating. Most of the time, I was dealing with drunks, lousy drivers, and the victims of burglary who were never going to get any justice. So I was over the moon when I was accepted into a specialist unit targeting serious crime. On my first night with the unit, I was assigned to carry out surveillance on a property used by a major gang. It was 3 a.m. London was in the grip of a heat wave that felt like it would never end. The unmarked car that I was in stank of the cheeseburger piled high with fried onions that my partner had just eaten. This mingled with the smell of sweat and the cheap air freshener in the shape of a tree which hung inches from my face. I had the window rolled down to try and get some relief, but the air was still and stale. I sighed. This is not how I had imagined the sharp end of fighting crime would be, but I had a job to do. The gang that we were targeting imported drugs and ran a network of dealers. They were scum, and I was going to do everything in my power to help bring them down. I focused back on the property. It was a gym on a busy street that was open 24 hours a day. It offered flexible memberships, according to the signage in the windows. And despite the late hour and the stifling heat, I could see a couple of people inside on treadmills. According to our intelligence though, the gym was a front. In the property's basement, there was a secure space where pure batches of newly imported narcotics were stored and tested before being moved on, mixed, and distributed. Sports bags full of the product could be carried in and out of the premises at all hours of the night and day, without raising any suspicions. The gang had dozens of properties like this all over London, hiding their activities in plain sight. We were there that night to photograph people entering and leaving the gym. Some would be innocent insomniacs there to exercise, Others would be working for the gang. It was methodical work and I was fine with that because I knew it would lead to results. And here came a new possible lead. A man was approaching the gym carrying a sports bag. I started taking pictures. We were parked a safe distance from the gym, so I was using a long lens. It brought the man now entering the gym into sharp focus. He was 6'2". He looked lean and fit. The gang's attention to detail included all of their couriers looking like they actually used a gem. I continued taking pictures as the man disappeared inside. I kept an eye on the gym equipment that I could see through the window, but was surprised when he did not make an appearance. He would be down in the basement, I figured, either handing over or collecting a new batch. I lowered the camera and sat back in my seat. By my side, my partner lit a cigarette. Oh, are you serious? I hissed. If you don't like it, call the health police. He replied with a sneer on his face. My partner had been a detective for 15 years. He was supposed to be mentoring me. All he had done so far was wind me up. I started to count to ten as my partner exhaled a new cloud of smoke, and then he said, I'm going for a coffee. You can hold the fort while I'm gone. He opened the door and just before he climbed out, he turned back and said, Oh, try not to mess up, boy. I watched him walk away. I was furious and appalled. It was like this was all a game to him, and I was a piece of dirt on the sole of his shoe. My mood did not improve as the night dragged on. When my partner finally reappeared hours later, I could smell alcohol on his breath. He settled back into his seat, yawned and said, Home Jeeves. And then he closed his eyes and moments later was snoring. I had said nothing over the radio to the team leader while I had been on my own, diligently recording the comings and goings at the gym butt. When we arrived back at the station to sign off at the end of the shift, I was so worked up that I couldn't stop myself. 
I knocked on the door of the detective in charge of the unit and asked if I could have a quiet word. He did not seem keen, but invited me to take a seat. I took a deep breath and told him what my partner had done. I said that I didn't want to make a formal complaint, but that I felt that his behavior was not acceptable. In my opinion, the detective simply nodded and thanked me. I left a feeling that I had done the right thing, but as I tried and failed to get some sleep ahead of my next night shift, I started to worry. There was an unwritten rule that you never spoke out against another officer. In 2023, that should not have been the case, but I had been a cop long enough to know that it was still true. By the time that I was heading back to the station, I felt sick to the core. Had I made a stupid mistake? As soon as I had entered the station, the answer started to become clearer. A couple of the other members of the unit who were heading out on assignment blanked me. They walked right past me without a word. Well, that's not strictly true. As the doors swung closed behind them, one of them muttered an obscenity. It was clearly directed at me, but it would have been easy to deny, so I tried to shrug it off and carried on along the hallway. When I got to the office where the unit was based, half a dozen of my colleagues were there working on their laptops. When I had joined the unit, I had been welcomed warmly. There had been handshakes, offers to help with anything that I needed, and invites to drink down at the pub and local barbecues. Now, it was like the temperature had been slammed down to 10 below zero. The others glanced up at me and then carried on working in silence. I hadn't noticed him at first, but my partner was there as well. He was standing by the water cooler. He did look me in the eye. The hatred in his gaze was clear. He walked towards me, and I tensed. I thought that he was going to strike me, but he just kept going. I took a couple of long breaths, nice and slow, trying to keep calm, and then I logged on to check my messages before I went to sign out the car for that night's surveillance. Only the first email that I saw was from the detective in charge of the unit, telling me that I was on desk duty. In a way, I was relieved that I wouldn't have to spend what would have been an agonizing night with my partner. But as I opened up the database that I had been ordered to update, I felt a strange mix of anger and despair at my situation, and things went steadily downhill after this. Night after night and week after week, I was kept chained to a desk doing drudge work. No one spoke to me. I was repeatedly criticized for the most petty things imaginable. I was also blamed for mistakes that other people had made. Away from work, I found it hard to sleep and I was on edge all the time. I knew the way that I was being treated was completely wrong and I could have gone to a union rep or made a direct complaint, but I didn't. Some people might say that I was weak, that I should have stood up for myself. But being bullied is an insidious process. It chips away at your self-belief bit by bit, reducing a person to something that even they hate. Eventually, I tried transferring, but my applications were all turned down. I soon realized word of my actions had reached beyond the unit. In desperation, I decided that I had two choices. Leave the police force or transfer away from London. I made my choice and a month or so later, in the grey light of a winter morning, I packed my belongings in my car and set off for the north of England. My new posting was in a coastal town. I would be back in uniform, back out on patrol. This felt like a backward step, but as the miles passed on the motorway, I told myself that I needed to be positive. I was still a police officer and this was the chance at a new start. One that I needed to grasp with both hands and make a success of. I stopped a couple of times along the way to fuel up the car and myself. By dusk, I was about an hour away from my destination. For this last leg, my navigation app told me that I needed to leave the main network and I soon found myself heading along a narrow, unlit road through featureless countryside. 
There were no signs that I could see in the encroaching gloom, but that wasn't a problem. Until the bars of my mobile phone flickered and then flattened out. Great, I thought. No signal. I slowed down. The road felt like it was one blind bend after another at this stage and I was nervous of a car traveling in the opposite direction. I had seen the results of enough road accidents in my police career to know how a few seconds of carelessness can change a life forever. Thankfully, there seemed to be no other traffic on the road, and apart from a few turnings which clearly led to country lanes, the road kept straight on. There was nowhere else to go but the coastal town where my future lay. When my headlights finally picked out a rust-speckled road sign saying the town was one mile away, I felt a wave of relief. I was tired after all day on the road and looking forward to putting my feet up and maybe having a beer. I did not have permanent accommodation in the town sorted yet, so I had booked into a hotel that I had found online. I didn't have a website, just a listing. When I had found the number shown, I was told by a gruff-sounding person that a room was available and that it was cash only. I still didn't have any signal on my phone, so... As I reached the outskirts of the town, I hoped the hotel would be easy to find. The road cut through a silhouetted row of buildings and brought me out onto what was clearly the town's main street. There was still no other traffic that I could see, and I slowed right down to take in the view. One side of the road was the seafront. There was a long, wide pavement and beyond that, the ocean. It reached out into the darkness. Looking out at the sea, a shiver passed through my body for some reason. It was tiredness, I had told myself, and stress. I had had more than enough of that in the last few months. Buildings lined the other side of the road. Under the streetlights, I saw a convenience store as I drove slowly along looking for the hotel. There was a barber's as well, a bookmaker's, and a pharmacy. There were no lights on in any of them, and I figured that they were closed for the night. A bit further along, I passed a cafe. It was still opened, and I could make out a few people inside, hunched over tables. A line of houses followed. Light seeped out through their drawn curtains. There were cars parked up by the side of the road. One of them had no wheels and was propped up on bricks. No one was out, not even walking a dog, and I couldn't hear any music playing or any raised voices. After London, work quietness is a rarity, and there's always something happening. It felt strange. No doubt things would feel different in the daytime. I told myself and then smiled. I could see the hotel. I pulled up in front of it. A yellow strip of light shone through a glass pane above the front door. The door had been painted white at some point, but that must have been a while ago, as the paint was faded and cracked in places. In one of the front windows of the hotel, a small sign saying, Vacancies was propped against the glass. Presumably, they had flipped it around when there were no vacancies. I must admit, though, as I got my bags out of the car and locked it, I couldn't imagine the hotel ever being full. It looked tired and shabby and unwanted. As long as my room had a comfy bed and hot water in the shower, it'd be fine for a few nights. I told myself and went up to the front door. There was a little bell which I pressed. I could hear a weak buzzing sound inside and I waited, and then waited some more. It was a cold evening and the wind was starting to bite at my skin. There seemed to be a mist drifting in off the sea as well. I pressed the bell again and this time did not take my finger off. A couple of minutes later I heard a gruff voice inside say, Okay, okay. And finally the door opened. A man peered out at me. He could have been anywhere between 40 and 60 years old. Honestly, I couldn't say. A week's worth of stubble and short greasy hair bookended a pale face riddled with broken veins. He looked at me and his nose wrinkled as if I was a bad smell. I remained patient and polite. Good evening, I said. I am Mr. Taylor and I have a reservation. 
He narrowed his eyes and said in a hoarse voice, I suppose you had better come in. It did not come as a surprise when he did not offer to help me with my bags. I picked them up and I trudged inside. After taking my payment in cash in full, he handed over a large key attached to a plastic disc with a number on it. The second floor. He growled by way of explanation, then headed into a nearby room and closed the door. It sounded like there was a quiz show playing on a TV in there. I sighed and made my way up the stairs. The carpet on them was worn bare in places. I couldn't tell if the carpet in the hallway was the same because there were no lights on. I took out my mobile phone and used the torch to look for a light switch. It was just to my right. I flicked it on but nothing happened. So I ran the torch across the ceiling and saw an empty socket where a light bulb should have been. My opinion of the hotel was getting lower by the minute. I used the torch on my phone to find my room. The lock was stiff but it opened eventually and I stepped into the room. There was a light bulb in the room. It flickered and then came on slowly to reveal grimy curtains that had once been pink but now made me think of bloodstains that somebody had tried to wash out. The walls were painted lime green and the bed sheets were brown. A small bedside table had a broken lamp on it and a printed sheet of instructions about what to do in the event of a fire. The reverse of the sheet informed me that smoking pets and takeaway food were not allowed in the room. There was nothing else, apart from the door leading to a cramped bathroom. I checked it out. And there were cracks in the sink and a shower cubicle with no curtain. The toilet should have been taped off as a crime scene. There was also the most disgusting smell that seemed to be coming from the sink and the shower as much as the toilet. Getting the drains fixed was one of the many things this place needed to get sorted, I thought, and then went back into the main room, sat in the bed and vowed that first thing in the morning, I would find somewhere else to stay. I was so unhappy that I didn't even bother undressing. I just laid down on top of my bed sheets and closed my eyes. I got no sleep. This was mainly because the window in the room did not close properly and rattled constantly in the wind. There were also the disturbing sounds of scratching that I heard every now and then. It started to get light at about 8am. I yawned, stretched and rolled over and found myself face to face with a mouse. It was standing on the pillow looking at me. Its nose twitched and then it scampered off. I groaned and went for a shower. The water came out in bursts of freezing cold and boiling hot and I felt worse after the shower than I had before. The feeling about 10 years older than when I had entered the room. I left. I had all my bags with me. There was no way that I was ever returning. I trudged down the stairs and I couldn't see anybody else around. The smell of fried food filled the hallway. It was like the air was thick with grease. A radio was playing in one of the rooms. I put the oversized key on a table by the front door and left with a sigh of relief. Outside it felt even colder than the night before. Litter rolled down the street and carried by the wind. I unlocked the car, threw my things in and got behind the wheel. I had a bar's worth of signal on my phone and managed to bring up a map of the town. The police station was 10 minutes down the road. The first thing that I was going to do was make a hot drink with two sugars. Everything else would have to wait. I looked in my back mirror, signaled, even though there was still no other traffic on the road and then set off. The sky was gray and the sea was grayer still. I could see for miles out over it. It looked bleak and icy cold and once again a shiver had passed through me. Thankfully, I could feel the first tendrils of heat reaching up from the car's heater. Feeling better for that, I drove on. As I neared where the map had said the police station was, I saw an old pier reaching out over the sea. It looked like it was on the verge of collapse. 
As such, it did not look out of place here. A minute or so later, I spotted the police station and parked up outside of it. The station was a one-story concrete building. The swirls of spray paint were still visible on the walls where graffiti had been almost but not quite been cleaned off. It had metal grills over the window and a sturdy looking door. A laminated sign with police in black letters ran across the top of the door. There was an intercom to one side of the door. I pressed it, cleared my throat and said, Hello, it's John Taylor. I'm the new officer. Hoping that they were expecting me, I stood back. And sure enough, the door buzzed. I pushed it open and went in. I found myself in a small reception area. There were two steel chairs that looked very uncomfortable and a low wooden table. A poster with the slogan, Lock it before you leave, was pinned on a cork board on the wall. And there was another door which opened with an arthritic click. A man in uniform stepped out into the reception area. He looked tired and his uniform was badly in need of a dry clean. We shook hands and he introduced himself as Martin Wilson. He was a police, a constable like myself. I followed him into the main part of the police station and he showed me where my locker was, the toilet and the holding cell. There was only one. It was a narrow, claustrophobic space with a stone platform for the prisoner to sit or sleep on. Wilson seemed friendly enough, but he moved slowly. It was like he was drained of energy. After the cell, we headed back to the office space. There were a couple of desktop computers which looked about 20 years old, and a fax machine. I had heard of these, but it was the first time that I had seen one in real life. Finally, my new colleague got down to business. Would you like a coffee? He asked. I smiled as I went over to the small kitchen area which took up one corner of the office. There was a kettle, a fridge, a jar of instant coffee, a jar of powdered milk, a bag of white sugar, half a dozen mugs, all of which were in desperate need of a wash and a sink. There was an unpleasant smell drifting up from the sink. It was the same as the smell in the bathroom at the hotel. I had not meant to, but I pulled a face. A tired smile spread across Wilson's face. Ah, uh, yes, he said. I'm sorry about the smell. The drainage system for the town is connected to the sea. It's meant to discharge out into the ocean, but sometimes the sea flows into the drains and everything gets blocked up and festers. And that smell is the result. He shrugged in a what can you do about it gesture, then asked me if I took sugar in my coffee. After Wilson had made us both a drink, we went back to the desktops. I sipped my coffee and shuddered. It was dreadful. Wilson turned the computer on. As it powered up slowly, accompanied by a chorus of buzzes and rattles, I asked Wilson how long he had been here. He sighed and replied, too long. He stared into his screen as it flickered into low-tech life before going on. I've seen better days and so has this town. When I first arrived, we still had tourists coming here. They had arrived on coaches from Manchester and Liverpool and stayed in the hotels and the guest houses that used to be all along the seafront. There's only one hotel left now and there's not been any tourists for a long time. They would rather go abroad where the sun is guaranteed. Without them, there's nothing here. No jobs, no money, no prospects. Why do people stay then? I asked. He shrugged. It's home and the local community is very tight-knit. People look after each other. There's actually very little crime as a result of this. His computer gave one final rattle and finally seemed to be up and running. He started tapping at the keys. I put the coffee down. I couldn't drink anymore. And Wilson's description of the town had left me feeling depressed. My new start was now feeling like a dreadful mistake. But I wasn't prepared to give up on day one. So, I said, when do we go out and patrol? 
He looked at me blankly, then understanding dawned on his face. Oh, patrol, he replied. And to be honest, I usually just stay in the station all day. But if you want to go, that's fine by me. Wow, this guy's standards had really slipped, I thought, but said nothing. I wanted to make friends here, not new enemies. So I simply smiled and said, Yes, I'll go on patrol. I'll go and get my uniform from my car and get changed. Then if you can give me the keys to the patrol car. He looked at me blankly again before saying, The patrol car broke down six months ago and is still not fixed. I said nothing, changed into my uniform and set off on patrol. Old school style on foot. I thought that it would be nice to walk by the sea, so I crossed over the road. As I did so, I noticed the unpleasant smell again and glanced down to see a gutter in the road. The odor coming out of it was so bad that I held my breath for a moment. A few minutes later, I passed the old pier that I had seen from the car. Close up, its decrepit state was shocking. It was made from cast iron that was eaten through in places by rust. I couldn't see any safety barriers where it ended out over the sea. I made a mental note to ask Wilson why the thing wasn't blocked off for health and safety reasons and then I carried on my way. There were a few people out and about. They all looked pale and kind of lethargic and no one was smiling. An old couple, both using walking sticks, were headed towards me. I smiled as they approached and said, Good morning. I'm your new police officer. It's lovely to meet you. They both glared at me and kept walking. I whistled under my breath and thought, Strike one, and then carried on. I tried saying hello to the next half a dozen people I saw, but nobody would engage with me. On estates in the poorest parts of London, the police were viewed as the enemy, so I wouldn't have been surprised by a negative reaction to a uniformed officer there. But I just couldn't see what the problem was here in this small town by the sea. Feeling deflated, I decided to call into a cafe that I had spotted and see if I could get a decent cup of coffee to lift my spirits. The smell of fried food once again assaulted my senses as I entered the cafe. This town was not a place for those who believed in healthy living. A handful of customers were sitting at tables. They were all silent and staring into their cups. One man was wiping a slice of white bread around his plate, mopping up the greasy remains of a meal. I didn't have the strength to say hello to anyone, so I went up to the counter and asked for a cappuccino to go. The man behind the counter wore a dirty white apron that was splattered with more grease. Acting as if I had asked for something utterly unreasonable, he poured a coffee into a beaker and handed it over without saying a word. The coffee looked like black sludge and was definitely not a cappuccino. Still not saying anything and still not wanting to rock the boat, I paid and left. There were wooden benches facing out to the sea here and there along the pavement. I slumped into one and looked at my coffee. I couldn't face it. I put it down on the bench and I stared out to the sea. There were no boats, which by this point did not surprise me just the endless grayness. There was a pebble beach sloping down to the sea. I tried to imagine holiday makers in the past, walking excitedly out of their hotels and heading for the beach to sit there and sunbathe and enjoy being by the water. But I just couldn't. It was so gloomy, it was no wonder tourists no longer came here. I shook my head, I got to my feet and continued on my patrol. I had taken half a dozen steps when I heard a voice behind me say, Shame. It was a deep and booming voice, and whoever had spoken was clearly not happy. I turned around. An old man was standing by the bench, glaring at me, and then he looked at the coffee cup that I had left on the bench. I cursed myself. I should have put it in a bin, but I had completely forgotten about it. While it was too late now, I was busted. Shame, the man repeated. He had a shock of thick gray hair, yellow teeth, and wore a pinstriped three-piece suit, 
that had seen much better days. He raised a finger and he pointed it at me. His fingernail was grossly long. Shame on you. An officer of the law littering our seafront. It is a disgrace. I shall be contacting your chief to make an official complaint. I must admit that I did not even know who my chief constable was for my new post. He or she was probably based a long way away in the city and would have no idea who I was and would probably have to look the town up on a map. Still, this was the last thing that I needed. I am very sorry, I began to say. It is too late for apologies, the man said talking over me, and then he turned and walked away. I watched him go and then trudged sadly on. I had bought a taste of the sandwich from the convenience store for my lunch and walked the streets until it started to go dark, and then headed back to the police station. Wilson was just finishing for the day when I had arrived. How did it go? He asked. I fessed up about my encounter with the man angry at my littering. Wilson grimaced. Not good. That sounds like Joshua Fenton. He's a well-established community leader. Wilson scratched his chin, and I could almost see the cogs inside his head turning as he thought. I'll try and have a word with him, he said eventually, and then he said goodnight and laughed. I put my head in my hands. I had been in town less than 24 hours and it was going from bad to worse. And there was no sign of that trend changing because I had nowhere to stay that night. Unless I went back to the only hotel in town. No way, I told myself, and went to get the rest of the bags out of my car. I carried them through to the cell and put them inside. I took out all my spare clothes and laid them on the stone platform that passed as a bed in the cell. Having made a crude mattress for myself, I laid down. It was horribly uncomfortable, but it was still better than the hotel. Thinking this, I closed my eyes and fell asleep. After a broken night's sleep, I gave up trying to rest. I put my things back in the bags and carried them out to the car. I didn't want Wilson to know that I had slept in the cell. It was early, so thankfully there was no sign of him. Having hidden the evidence of my sleeping arrangements, I washed in the sink. The unpleasant smell rising up from it seemed even worse and it made me feel sick. This made the prospect of the instant coffee even less appealing. So I went to see if I could find anywhere in this forsaken town where I could get a decent drink. I stepped out into the street and stopped dead in my tracks. The dense mist was rolling in over the sea. It was eerie and strangely beautiful. Wanting to take a closer look, I crossed the road. The mist by now had obscured the horizon and was moving rapidly towards the shore. In what felt like no time at all, it reached where I stood and then enveloped me. I could see my hands in front of me but nothing else. The mist was cold against my skin and had a smell that reminded me of the odor that rose from the sinks in the gutter. It was horrible, and I was deciding if I should try and find my way back to the station when I heard a strange sound in the distance. It seemed to have come from the direction of the sea. It could have been the wind, I thought, or a seagull. I had no idea. I listened and there it was again. It was a high, keening sound, almost like I tensed, listened harder. Yeah, it sounded like somebody crying out, somebody who surely needed help. I'm conscious that I was unsighted because of the mist, I started to walk towards where I thought the sound had come from, and then I heard it again. The call was louder this time and more urgent. I began to jog, guided by the call. My heart was beating fast and I could feel the rush of adrenaline. I shouted out, Police, who is it? What's wrong? There was no reply apart from a new, desperate call. I sprinted towards it, racing blindly through the mist which was beginning to clear. 
Suddenly, I could see the ground. It was iron, corroded with rust. Something was very wrong, and I knew it. I stopped in my tracks. The mist was continuing to clear. As quickly as it had descended, it had lifted, and I could see exactly where I was. I was standing at the ragged edge of the pier. Twenty feet below me, the sea rose and fell in a torrent of gray. Fear slammed through me. If I had taken another couple of steps, I would have fallen from the pier, into that maelstrom. Odds are I would have been killed. Gingerly, I took a backward step and then another, inching away from the precipice. In my panic, I had forgotten about the voice calling out that it almost led me to my death. I looked around. I had an unbroken view of the ocean now, and there was no one in the water. I listened, and the only thing that I could hear was the sound of the waves crashing into each other and the worn supports of the pier. I turned and began to walk back to the station. If there was someone in the water, then the Coast Guard needed to be called in, and a search and rescue operation be launched. Only as I approached the station, I began to wonder, had it all been my imagination? I was already stressed out and exhausted after two nights with hardly any sleep. Was my mind twisting ordinary things out of shape because of this? I hurried inside the station and found Wilson had arrived. Trying to remain professional. I told him what had happened, though I left out the part about me almost toppling into the sea. He listened patiently and seemed entirely unconcerned. It's the mist, he said. The first few times you experience it, it can make you disoriented and sends your imagination into overdrive. To be honest, what you probably heard was a seagull. Starting to feel pretty stupid, I looked at my shoes and said, That's one of the things that I thought it was at first. Well, there you go, he said. Mystery solved. Now, how about we start the day properly? He took a flask out of a plastic shopping bag that he had with him and added, I made this at home. It's proper coffee. He unscrewed the lid of the flask and the most wonderful smell of rich, filtered coffee drifted out. It was such a simple thing and it made me happier than I had been in what felt like a very long time. To make things even better, Wilson also produced a large blueberry muffin from the shopping bag. Reinvigorated by the coffee and muffin, I set off on patrol, leaving Wilson to put his feet up. I was still not impressed with his approach to being a police officer, but I did not mind so much because of his thoughtful gesture. My second day on patrol was much like my first. I was not a welcome presence in the town, but give it time, I thought. The townsfolk would get used to seeing me out on the beat and slowly they would come around. Well, that was my plan anyway as I walked up and down the main street punctuated by a stop off in the cafe, where I loaded up on some carbs. As dusk started to fall, I headed back to the station. Wilson was just leaving as I had arrived. He looked as though that he had something on his mind, as if he had had something he wanted to say. I did not push him, and after an uncomfortable gap, he finally looked at me and said, I appreciate what you're trying to do. I wish I could do the same, but it's just, uh, I think you're strong inside and I'm not. I tried to think of something to say in reply, but Wilson was already walking away. We can talk more tomorrow, I thought as I watched him head down the street. The first flecks of a new sea mist were drifting in, and soon I had lost sight of him as the mist once more obscured everything. I sighed and went into the station to prepare for another night in the cell. It was still mighty uncomfortable, but I had managed a good couple of hours of sleep. And in the morning, after I had washed, I promised myself that arranging proper accommodation would be one of my priorities for the day. 
I turned one of the ancient PCs on and started searching online while I waited for Wilson to arrive. By 9.30, when there was still no sign of him, I started to get concerned. I found his home details on the system and tried calling him, but his landline and mobile rang out. I decided the best thing to do was head out on patrol as normal and make a detour to his house to check if he was okay. I was not far from the station when I saw the distinctive figure of Joshua Fenton heading my way. I had already figured out that he was one of those people who always had a grievance just simmering under the surface and sure enough, he walked right to me and pretty much shouted in my face. The police are worthless, they do nothing to keep us safe. You strut around the town as if you own it and the other one Wilson, he's the worst. He's a drunk, did you know that? Did you? I felt his spittle against my skin as his tirade flared. Thankfully, he seemed to be done. He gave me one last filthy look and stomped off. Much as I had hated to believe anything this man said, it struck me that it was possible Wilson was absent from work because he was sleeping off a hangover. And strictly speaking, I should report his absence to our superiors. But I wasn't going to go down the path of speaking out against a colleague again. I took a deep breath and carried on my way. I didn't make it far before another of the sea mists began to descend. I was close to one of the benches so I decided to put my feet up until it passed. I sat down and looked out at the approaching wall of mist and was alarmed when I noticed there was a woman standing in the water. She wasn't far out. The sea only lapped at her ankles, but I did not think it was safe for her to be there. I shouted out to her and waved my arms. All she did was wave back. I cursed under my breath and hurried out onto the pebble beach and towards her. You need to come out of the sea, I said as I reached the water's edge. The mist was closing in rapidly on both of us. I could still see her clearly enough for the moment though. She looked about my age and had long and dark hair. In different circumstances, my first thought might have been how beautiful she was, but I found her behavior too concerning. Trying to ignore the freezing cold water lapping around my legs, I finally made it to her. We were close enough to touch and close enough to see each other despite the mast. She smiled and said, You're a policeman as well. Her voice was soft, almost musical in its tone. I am, I replied, not sure what she meant, but this wasn't the time to be worrying about it. And I would like you to come back with me to the shore where it's safe, I added. She laughed and put her hand on my shoulder and said, No, I want to go further out. Come with me into the depths, my love. There was an edge to her smile now, a darkness in her eyes that I did not like. I moved away from her. To the sea, she said. To the sea. Her voice sounded different. It was harsh and her words felt like they were rushing towards me like a wave. I took a step away from her and said, I am not going any further out into the sea with you. Her mouth twisted into a sneer and her lips had parted. She bared her teeth and hissed, You are mine, mortal. And then she changed. The skin and flesh on her face seemed to drift away, revealing the skull beneath, and her hair came alive. It rose and twirled into grotesque, filthy tendrils, which whipped out at my face. She was hideous, a creature from a nightmare made real. I staggered backwards and almost fell into the sea, but I managed to keep my feet and stumbled away. The thing in the sea called out as I fled. An inhuman sound which even in my panic, I realized that I had heard before. It was the sound which had called out to me and led me to the pier in my brush with death. Running blind, I made it back to shore. I stood there with my hands on my knees, gasping for breath, and the mist began to clear. I was safe. 
and I could see people emerging from their houses. Their faces were pale and drawn. They looked shocked and afraid, but they were coming to my aid. My relief was tempered though, when I saw Joshua Fenton was walking at the head of the approaching crowd. His eyes blazed with fury and as he came closer to me, he raised his hand and pointed an accusing finger. You, he screamed, you should have gone with her. The sirens take those they choose and lead the rest of us in peace. Now we must make an offering to the sea and beg their forgiveness. I was dumbstruck by his words and struggling to understand why some of the townsfolk were dragging a small boat towards me. And then others of their number grabbed a hold of me and began trying to bind my arms and legs with rope, all led by the shouted instructions of Joshua Fenton. There were other voices as well. They were out at sea. I glanced that way and saw a dark figure standing in the waves. It was the creature that I had escaped from, and it was not alone. There were more of the fiends emerging into sight. Their voices joined their dark sisters in a chorus of primal, terrifying screams. And I understood. I was to be the offering. If the townsfolk could get me into the boat and I was unable to escape, I would be taken out to sea. I would be sacrificed to the creatures that they called sirens. I had one chance. I twisted and pulled away from the townsfolk. I kicked and punched and bit in a desperate frenzy, and suddenly I was free and forcing my way out of their midst. I ran because my life depended on it, and I needed to get to the police station. I could lock myself in and call for help. Pursued by the baying mob whose cries were framed by the screams of the sirens I ran on, I looked back once and could see with horror that the ocean itself seemed to be in a fury. High waves were crashing over the beach and up onto the pavement. I turned away. My lungs were burning as I ran and my legs felt like they would give way at any moment. But I made it. I barreled into the station and was hit by a nauseating stench. It was one that I had smelt before but this was extreme. I began to choke. And then I noticed a thick, dark liquid pooling on the floor. It was bubbling out of the sink. It was unbearable and I had to get away from it. Fighting back the urge to vomit, I stumbled from the station back out onto the street. There was more of the sickening liquid rising from the gutter and spreading across the road. Beyond that, the sea continued to surge. It had reached the road now where it was mixing with the fetid waste. The townsfolk were all running for cover but one man was left standing in the midst of the swirl of filth and sea. Joshua Fenton had his arms raised and was begging the sirens for forgiveness. The foul waste in the sea was rising with a shocking speed. It was already up to his knees. He continued to cry out, imploring the sisters to have mercy. But if the dark forces that ruled here heard his pleas, they ignored him. The corrupted water pulled him off his feet and swept him back and into the ocean. I saw him claw at the air and try and call out one more time, and then I lost a sight of him beneath the filth-infected waves. I stood there feeling numb and watched as the sea and wastewater had subsided. The townsfolk had all disappeared inside. The town was silent, the sea gray and empty. It was over. The sirens had their sacrifice. Joshua Fenton was in their abhorrent embrace. I composed myself as best I could and then called headquarters on my phone and reported that there had been a tragic incident. And then I paused, holding the phone away from me. Joshua Fenton was dead. And so I realized was Wilson, the flawed but good man who had told me that he was weak. He must have gone with the siren out to sea. Well, I could do one thing for him at least. I lifted the phone back up and I lied. I told them that there had been a storm and a tidal wave had flooded the town. There were two people missing, presumed dead. Joshua Fenton, who had been swept out to sea, 
and Wilson who had been caught in the waves as he protected the townsfolk. He was a hero, I told them. And then I ended the call. There was nothing more to be said or done. I knew no one outside of the town would believe me about the sirens and I wanted nothing to do with the townsfolk who would have sacrificed me to save their own hides. Let the sirens take them, I thought, and then walked away. I'm no longer a policeman now. I drift from place to place, always cities and always far from the coast. At night I dream that the sirens are calling me and when I wake, I can still hear them in the distance. And then the dream fades and I'm left alone, knowing that no matter where I go, I will never be able to escape the sea and the terror that it brings. <laughs>